Pod of four, Adhikarana one, nature of freedom, doubt. In the Upanishad occurs the text, thus indeed does this serene happy being become manifest or established in its own real form, that is, self or nature, after having risen from this body and having reached the highest light. Chandogya Upanishad 8.12.3 With regard to this, the doubt arises. Does that being become manifest with some adventitious distinction, as it happens in some region of enjoyment like heaven? Or is it established as the self alone? What should be the conclusion? Opponent That manifestation must be in some fresh form, even as in other regions, for liberation too is well known to be a result, and the term becomes manifest is synonymous with is born. If this be a mere establishment in its own form or nature, then since one's own nature is not eliminated even in the earlier stages of being under other guises, that nature should have manifested itself even there. Hence, the being becomes manifest as something distinctive. Vedantin, this being the position, we say, Sutra 1, Sampadya virbhava svena shabdat, Sampadya, having reached the highest light, Avirbhavaha, there is manifestation of the soul. Svena Shabdat, because of the use in the Upanishad of the term Svena in its own self. Translation, having reached the highest light, the soul becomes manifest in its own real nature because of the use of the term in its own in the Upanishad. The soul manifests itself just as it really is, but not as possessed of any other quality. How can this be so? Because the word own occurs in becomes established in its own real form. Otherwise, this specification with the word own would have been inappropriate. Opponent. The word own should be interpreted to mean owned by itself. Vedantin. No, for that is not under reference here. Had that been meant here, then in whatever form that being would become manifest would certainly be owned by it, so that the use of the word own would be useless. But if the meaning in itself be accepted, it serves a purpose inasmuch as it implies that the soul becomes manifest merely in its own form and not in any adventitious form as well. Opponent what difference is there between the earlier states and this final one, when the non-elimination of the true form is the same in either case? Vedantin. Here comes the reply. Sutra 2. Mukta Pratijnanat. The soul is then muktaha, free. Pratijnanat. That being the declaration. Translation. The soul then attains liberation, that being the Upanishadic declaration. The entity that is spoken of here as becoming manifest in itself becomes free from its erstwhile bondage and continues as the pure self, whereas in the earlier state it seemed to have become blind, Chandogya 891, seemed to be weeping, Chandogya 8102 seemed to have undergone destruction, Chandogya 8.11.1, so that it was in a condition of being tainted by the three states of waking, dream, and sleep. This is the difference. Opponent, how again is it known that the soul becomes free? Vedantin, the aphorist answers by saying, 
that being the Upanishadic declaration. Thus it is that in the text, I shall explain it to you over again. Chandogya 893. The promise is made of explaining the self, free from the defects of the three states. And then it is stated, the being that is really without any body is not touched by the likes and dislikes. Chandogya 8.12.1. And the conclusion is made with, it becomes established in its own self. That is the highest being. Chandogya 8.12.3. So also at the commencement of the story, the text, the self that is beyond sin, etc., Chandogya 8.12.1, makes a declaration about the free soul alone. Liberation comes to be considered as a fruit merely from the point of view of the cessation of bondage and not from the standpoint of production of any fresh result. Although the term becomes manifest is synonymous with is born, still that is said by way of contrast to the earlier state, just as we would say that a man becomes established in health when his disease leaves him. Hence, there is no defect. Sutra 3. Atma Prakaranat. The light is Atma, the self, Prakaranat, because of the context. Translation. The light is the self as it is obvious from the context. Opponent, how can the soul be said to be liberated since the text, having reached the supreme light, Chandogya 8.12.3, describes it as within the creation itself? For by usage the word light denotes physical light. One who has not turned back from created things cannot become free, since all created things are well known as sources of sorrow. Vedantan, that is no defect, since from the context it is obvious that the self itself is presented here by the word light. As the topic of the supreme self is made the starting point in the sentence, the self that is beyond sin, free from all dirt, and free from death, Chandogya 8.12.1, it is not possible to jump to the physical light all of a sudden for that will be tantamount to discarding the subject matter under discussion and introducing something foreign to it. The word light is seen to be used for the self as well, as in, upon that immortal light of all lights, the gods meditate. Brihadaranyaka 4.4.16 This was elaborated under the aphorism, light is Brahman, Brahma Sutra 1.3.40. Namaste. So this is the beginning of the fourth pada of the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra. And this is really the climax of the whole thing. The result of the sadhana described in the previous sections. And especially in the third pada, which we just completed, the description of the soul leaving the body and attaining the spiritual world is unique in all the Vedic literature for its depth and completeness and, of course, the fact that it's about something we can't know by any human intelligence. It is beyond apurusheya, beyond human knowledge, because it deals with things that are blocked by the upadi of individuality. As soon as we accept being an individual, separate from God and everybody else, you know, we lose the ability to remember, for example, our previous lives. We also lose the ability to see the future in the sense of what the activities and ideas and impressions that we are holding now will do to us in the next life and how those impressions will manifest in the form that we take in the next life. So here the aphorist says, 
that when the soul attains the spiritual world, that means enlightened in the conditioned Brahman, huh? the reason it's the conditioned Brahman is because there's a journey, there's an attainment, there's someone who attains. So there's still a tiny little bit of individuality left, but not enough to preclude the cognition. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And Brahman is all there is. Sarva Kalvidam Brahma. So once one realizes this Brahma Vidya, after the death of the present body, he goes to the spiritual world, and there he assumes his real form. And what is that? Well, in the process of attaining liberation, one worships God or goddess in a particular form and develops a specific relationship with the deity. And this relationship, which is eternal, actually, it's, it's not exactly developed, it's more or less discovered or uncovered in the process of sadhana. This is called nitya swarup. Sva means own or exactly oneself. And rupa, of course, means form. So swarup and nitya means eternal. So this form is of the nature of a relationship with the Supreme. Nitya, it's eternal. And Svarupa, it is one's own real form. So this can be in any one of the five rasas, uh, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, or conjugal love. My favorite. <laughs> But before we get into all those details, we have to understand that the soul is being situated in a world where there's no scarcity, no competition, no ignorance, hate and stuff like that, and no death. That all the beings in that world from Hiranyagarbha on down attain enlightenment and merge into Brahman at the end of this universal creation. So this is the ultimate goal or fate or the process of liberation that awaits all of us on the spiritual path. And it should serve as an impetus, as motivation to do the business of sadhana, uh, which is ultimately neti neti, getting rid of all the things that are not Brahman, <laughs> until we become cleansed or purified of things like false ego, material desires, likes and dislikes, false ideas about the nature of reality, and so on. This is our duty. Why? Because we deserve to live in such a way that we are always happy. But that's not possible in the material world because everything in the material world is only temporary. The body, the mind, the identity, the ego, even the world itself ultimately dies and disappears. So what chance is there of happiness in that kind of a situation? You know, never ceases to amaze me how the materialists can stay motivated. You know, the bodybuilders and the politicians and the big money people and everything. How can they stay so motivated when they know, I mean, everybody knows past a certain age, they are going to die. 
Not only them, but everybody. That's just the nature of this world. So how does somebody stay motivated in an atmosphere of death and dissolution? I don't get it. I mean, they really have to be like <laughs> covered over with ignorance to think that anything in this world is worth striving for. Yeah, you must have at least the basics of a comfortable life to be able to perform sadhana. And you get that by doing karma yoga. Here, we're talking about the ultimate result of spiritual life. But most people are really in the neophyte beginner stage. Huh? Isn't it? It's true. And it means you. <laughs> that you still have problems in life. So that means you have to perform karma yoga. Not bhakti, not meditation, and certainly not jnana. Huh? Those will all come in time. But first you have to get free from the time-wasting obligations of material life caused by poverty and ignorance. And then you can have a life that's free or relatively free from problems so that you can perform your sadhana and attain the enlightenment, the liberation, moksha, that is the ultimate nature of the spirit soul. Aum Tatsa, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.